Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Today we're in for a really, really nice presentation. Jeff and Jennifer send their best. They happen to be on vacation, uh, but they've arranged for just a magnificent presentation from Ms. Price. Uh, today's presenter is Elizabeth Price, has been a certified Oregon State University Master Gardener since 2008 and has been leading workshops on conifers for other master gardeners and for the public for over a decade. This interest in conifers led her to writing a book on the subject, which Oregon State University Press published this past June. Elizabeth also took all of the 1,000 photographs that appear in her book. She holds an MFA in creative writing from the University of Arizona and has worked as a professional writer, editor, and curriculum designer. Uh, those are truly impressive credentials. Uh, so with that, Ms. Price, the screen is yours. Oh, thank you, Byron. Uh, thank you. And thanks for Jeff uh, for inviting me back again this year. Uh, I really enjoyed the talk I gave last February, um, which was on species in the Cypress family. So this year, uh, we're going to focus on the pine family, which is, um, I think, considerably easier than the Cypress family. So this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, just the types of foliage that we find in the pine family and the different genera that have those types. And then we're gonna just take one genus at a time, hopefully getting through all seven that we see in uh, commonly in this part of the world, but probably not. Uh, time permitting, we will talk about large and Douglas fir, but um, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but we're, we're certainly gonna spend a lot of time on the pines, spruce, true cedar, true fir, and the hemlocks. All species in the pine family are needled conifers, as opposed to uh, most of the species in the cypress family, which have are scale-like foliage, you know, like junipers and the cypresses and uh, other uh, species like uh, western red cedar. Uh, and some of them in the pine family have uh, needles that in that attach to the branch uh, individually, like uh, spruce, hemlock, true fir, and Douglas fir where each needle will directly attach to the, to the twig. And then there are two genera with world foliage, true cedar and larch, where the foliage is in a whorl on top of um, a spur shoot. Which is, this little um, stem is called a spur shoot. And then we have um, pine, which are also bundled needles, but they're bundled into a, uh, a structure called a fascicle. Uh, which is unique to pines. No other genus in the uh, pine family has this structure. And we are going to start with the pine genus. Uh, we're going to spend a fair bit of time on pines because they are by far the, it is by far the biggest genus in the family with uh, approximately 110 species. A very uh, successful genus. Um, and like junipers uh, in the cypress family, which is the most successful Jesus and that family, they have similar adaptations that make them successful, and which we'll talk about um, as we go along here. And here's a picture of emerging pollen cones on ponderosa pine, which are truly, truly striking. And when I lived for a few years in the high desert in eastern Oregon and Bend, I was surrounded by these beautiful cones every spring. Um, quite stunning. So uh, once you've determined you're in the pine genus by identifying that the species has a fascicle, the first thing you wanna determine to get to your species ID is how many needles are in that bundle. And that will be two, three, or five needles. And there is one exception. There is one species with a single needle and that is the pinion, one of the pinion pines, Pinus monophylla from the Southwest of the country. And here it is here, you see it's just one needle. Um, and it's sort of this, the exception, as they say, that proves the rule, because even though it is not bundled clearly because it is just a single needle, they don't need to be bundled. They still have all the other all the other anatomy that um, the two, three and five needle uh, pines have. Um, and so when you 
two needle pines, you want to think about, uh, you know, the shore pine, Scots pine, the uh, Austrian black pine, the Japanese black pine. Those are a number of the two needle pines. There are far fewer three needle pines. Uh, the ponderosa pine is one of them and the lace bark pine also. The five needle pines uh, are all the white pines, uh, like Western white pine, Eastern white pine, uh, Japanese white pine, uh, and some of the needles are short and stiff like this one here, uh, which are typical of pines of the mountains. And some of them are very long and wispy, which is more typical of like the Eastern white pine um, and Western white pine. So pines have taken uh, two evolutionary paths and are broken into two subgenera, the pinus subgenus and the strobus subgenus. And the reason why it's helpful to think about pines in these two big groups is because each group has certain identifiable features that'll help you get to a species ID. Um, and so in the pinus subgenus, you have mostly two needle pines with a few three needle pines. And in the strobus subgenus, you have mostly five needle pines with a few three needle pines. Um, and the um, defining feature anatomically that differentiates these two groups is that the pinus genus, subgenus has two vascular bundles per needle and the strobus subgenus one. And this is not something you can observe with the naked eye, but we will see some pictures. I have been able to photograph it and get it up to show up in a picture. Um, uh, and in the pinus subgenus, most of the conifer seeds um, are wind dispersed first, which is typical of you know most conifers, the seeds are wind dispersed, except for junipers and some uh, pines in the subgenus stro strobus, which are the, the pines which are have seeds which are dispersed by birds, and they have many adaptations for that. Um, and the cone scales in the pinus subgenus and, and the strobus subgenus are also different. And they have different this different feature called an umbo which is a, something odd that I will talk about later. And the reason why it's, it's good to know what the umbo looks like is because differences in it can uh, help you determine what the, what the species is. So these photographs were very difficult to take um, <laughs> because the feature is so small that I couldn't see what I was focusing on with my camera. I could only see it after I loaded them onto my computer and blew them up like this. But if you, uh, pinch all the needles in a fascicle together with your fingers, they form a cylinder. And uh, two needle pines that you can see that each uh, needle is a half a half a half a moon and the other ones are pie shaped, the three needle pines and the five needle pines. And so I'm gonna zoom in here. Um, so you can actually see, so this, this is a ponderosa pine. You can actually see the two, the vascular bundles here. Here's one and here's two. Um, uh, making it, uh, so in the vascular bundle is where the xylem and the phloem enter the needle from the twig. And then over here in this five needle pine, you can just see there's one per needle. And over here in this two needle pine, again, there's two. So um, I think that's very interesting because I, you know, I didn't ever think I would be able to capture this in a photograph until I, I unloaded them on my computer and, um, it is interesting if you think about it. So, you know, this two needle pine has uh, four vascular bundles, you know, per fascicle, and this one has five, which it, so it winds up being about the same number given uh, how many needles those species have. Uh, the pine genus uh, has very distinct cones. The cones are very diversified, and oftentimes uh, having a cone will lead you directly to species ID. Um, the most distinct cones of any genus in the pine family and probably uh, of all conifers. Uh, but they take quite a long time to mature. They take two growing seasons to mature. Uh, they, in the spring, they appear as these very small, you can see that's my index finger of my left hand. So it's a very small cone. And you can see that the needles are just emerging, the fresh needles. So they are pollinated in the spring of the first year. These are the bracts that are showing right now. All cones are made up of bracts and scales and the scales at this point are too small to see. And the pollen just sort of sifts in between these, these bracts uh, uh, to, reach the, uh, to reach the egg eventually. Um, uh, the cone grows slightly over the first uh, summer and then enters a rest period in the winter. 
And then in the spring right now, if you were to go out and look at your pines, uh, look at the branch ends, you will see these, this is actually small, it's just blown up, a small bristly cone like this uh, that um, will soon be fertilized as soon as the growing season begins. So those are evident right now uh, on, on pines at the, at the branch ends. And they're fun to look at because until you actually try to find them, you don't really notice them, but they're there. And then the cone grows rapidly at the, uh, in that first summer uh, and then grows to full size and um, matures by late summer or fall. And this is a shore pine. It's a two needle pine. It's in the, so that's in the Pinus subgenus. And this is the umbo, was that the thing I mentioned uh, earlier? And it is an artifact of the cone having spent a winter on the tree when the cone was still quite small. So this piece here that I'm highlighting with my uh, pointer uh, is the umbo. And it is the oldest part of the cone, visible part of the cone, because uh, it was there from the beginning. And when the cone grows rapidly that summer, the new tissue around that tissue that spent the winter on the cone is greener and the other part is darker because it's just older tissue. And you say, well, why do I care about this? Well, this umbo has characteristics that can help you identify um, the species. Some of them have a prickle like this. Some of them don't have a prickle. Some of them, the umbo is raised up and some are in some species it's flattened. So that detail can be very, very helpful in getting to species ID and luckily, Pines are very readily, they, they set cones very readily and you're often going to have a cone. So some genera, you probably aren't gonna have a cone, but in pines, um, pines set a lot of cones and they set, typically set a lot of cones at a young age. Um, and this is just a close up of that. The Pinus subgenus has this central umbo, which tells you, uh, the location of it tells you that it's this subgenus and this group, mostly two needle pines. And the prickle is considered a deterrent for birds to uh, discourage birds from trying to access the seeds. Now in the other subgenus, strobus, uh, the cones look quite different. The umbo is very indistinct. It's at, it's at the edge of the scale rather than the center. And it is really not useful for species ID. Um, and you can see how, uh, in the case of these pines, the scale grow, the scale elongates, uh, or in the other group of pines, it kind of grows out from the center, which is why this is located at the edge. Um, and these are the two basic forms of cones you have in, in, in the strobus subgenus, which are mostly the, those five needle pines. Uh, in one on the left here is from the white bark pine, and it is one of the bird pines in that it is. Uh, Seeds are grown to be harvested by the Clark's nutcracker. The, the Clark's nutcracker and this pine co-evolved. Um, and you see that this cone does not have a stalk. That's another feature to look for in a cone. It'll help you with species idea. Does the cone have a stalk or not? And you see this one does not on the left and this one on the right does not. And those are both adaptations. Um, nothing is an accident in, in nature. There's always a, a reason for it. There's a reason it gives the, the plant some uh, advantage in nature. And in this case, it, it secures the, the cone um, to the branch, uh, allowing the birds to uh, more easily access uh, the seeds. It's going to be a stable platform. Where over here, this very long stalk of the white Himalayan white pine uh, means that these are going to sway in the wind and make it more difficult for birds to access the seeds. So that is a bird deterrent. Also in the white bark pine, uh, you see how this is facing up. And that is to advertise to the birds, you know, here I am, come get the seeds. They're all nice and ripe. Um, but that also subjects the seeds inside to a lot of solar radiation, which can be damaging. And so this particular species has these very thick scales, which protect the seeds inside from that sun. Um, and the scales remain closed. Uh, uh, it is the job of the Clark's nutcracker to break open these these scales and access the seeds with its beak, which is specially designed for that. And over here for the Himalayan white, white pine, you see that these cones are hanging down. These are like 12 inch cones. They're really spectacular. Um, 
and they aren't in the sun, they don't need those thick scales to protect the seeds and the seeds will open and they're uh, wind dispersed and they just fall out and, and fly in the wind. So, and the pine genus also has very distinct buds. Um, and having a, a bud, um, looking at a bud will also often get you directly to species ID. Um, and these are three two needle pines here. Uh, the one in the left in the middle are the two of the black pines, the Austrian black pine and the Japanese black pine, which look a great deal alike. Um, it can be difficult to differentiate. Um, but if you look at the buds, you know, you can see that the buds are dramatically different. Um, in fact, my neighbor has, it turns out, has an Austrian black pine, and I can kind of see it over there in the distance. Uh, but I didn't realize what species it was until recently when we had a windstorm, and I was cleaning up, and I picked up a twig, and I saw this bud there, and I thought, oh, he has an Austrian black pine. <laughs> and uh, Japanese black pine have these rarely striking long um, candle-like buds with these very soft scales on the outside. Um, and if you have a uh, like a thunderhead, if anyone has a thunderhead Japanese black pine right now, this is pretty much what it looks like. Very beautiful and very striking. And up to the point that it's decorative, it's like this very like bright light in the middle um, of the end of, e of each of the stems. And here's just another distinctive one from the Bosnian pine, uh, which is a lovely slow growing um, pine with a beautiful form that uh, is quite cold hardy. So the uh, only issue with buds is that they're not on the um, tree uh, year round. They're available to look at from, you know, the fall when they set until spring when growth starts. Um, but if you do have a young pine that doesn't have cones yet, at least you can look at the buds. So pines are particularly well adapted to difficult circumstances um, of hot and arid climates and cold and arid climates. Um, and you, at one time the planet was very warm and wet um, worldwide from pole to pole. There were coniferous forests in the Arctic and the, the planet at that time was very, very swampy. And uh, pines do not do well, they're not very tolerant of, of warm and humid conditions. And so when the planet started to dry out, um, about 35 million years ago, when other conifer species started to um, be, become outcompeted by flowering trees, pine genus started to diversify and add species, um, which was very unusual at the time for conifers because they are well adapted to hot and arid and cold and arid environments. And if you think of, you know, dry mountainous, like on the east side of the Cascades here in the Northwest, we have high desert and we also have, you know, you know, mountains, uh, dry mountains. And, and high in the mountains, you see that the pines are the dominant species. And in the high desert, you also see that pines are the dominant species in association with junipers. Um, and junipers and pines both are well adapted to what's going on in the planet right now, which is this in the hotter, the drier climate. And um, in places like the high desert, you have not just extreme heat, you have extreme cold in combination with that dryness. And pines are just well adapted to those situations. Uh, and so that in combination with the fact that many of them are, seeds are dispersed by birds gives them an advantage over other conifers, which is also the same as the junipers in the cypress family. They are also well adapted to the stressful environment and their, their berry-like cones are also distributed by birds, which um, is an adaptation that is not common in the uh, in conifers. Okay, we're going to move on to the spruce genus, um, which has you know often very lovely decorative cones, both uh, the pine cones. I mean, sorry, the, the pine cones, the spruce cones, and the uh, the spruce pollen cones are can be very colorful. And here's a picture of um, the cones of the push nori spruce, which is a small, you know, nice back, you know, a small size spruce that you can fit in your backyard where the nori spruce species is enormous and most people just don't have room for it. But this is a small mounding shrub that sets these beautiful red cones from a young age. So it's it's quite um, delightful to have in the garden. And uh, so the way you know you have a spruce is that 
all spruces without exception have needles that terminate at a peg and then the peg attaches to the twig. Um, no other, you know, hemlock also have this feature, but it's a very tiny peg and there are other features of spruce um, that you can look for, which will separate it from a hemlock, make you see that it's not a hemlock. Um, and this is a, a Colorado blue spruce, which is a really good subject for teaching uh, spruce uh, features because all the features of spruce are very clear on it. Um, the needle and the twig are a, a very dramatically different color. So you can see that here the uh, the needle terminates at a peg and then the peg attaches to the branch. Um, and that if you were trying to pull off one of these needles, you may actually pull off the peg with it. But when the needles drop, the peg remains on the on the twig. And you can see here is a, a dead twig picked up from the ground. Uh, it looks like little just little, little coat hangers. <laughs> um, another uh, feature that spruce have that'll differentiate it from other genera like true fir um, is that it has these grooves. Um, the branches, the twigs aren't smooth. They have these grooves that are, you know, part of the structure of the peg itself. Um, other features that spruce have um, that'll differentiate it from other genera are that the, the needles are usually very, quite sharp. Again, this is the uh, blue spruce, Picea pungens, pungen means sharp. Um, and typically if you grab a, uh, a spruce twig, you know, one way you'll know it's a spruce is that it's gonna hurt when you touch it. Um, and also spruce needles are four-sided. Um, and this is the only genus that has four-sided needles. They're not always square, but sometimes here square, you can see it, this, uh, Picea pungens uh, needle and cross section, but sometimes this two of the sides will be a bit flattened and it won't be square, but it will be four sided. And so determining whether your foliage is square or not will help you get to species ID. That is one of the features um, that you want to look for. Is the needle square or is it not square? You know, um, like Sitka spruce does not have a square needle, but it has a four-sided needle, but you know, Picea pungent does as well as some others. Um, also in spruce, the needles encircle the twig 360 degrees. Um, they aren't always evenly distri distributed on uh, all around, but um, it is on the, the uh, Colorado spruce here. So that's something else to look for. And there is one exception, it's the Serbian spruce, which is a lovely uh, spruce with many, uh, uh, there's the, the pendula, which is the, the weeping spruce, and there's also many bun-shaped uh, spruces, uh, Serbian spruces available on the market. And, uh, you know, I had um, read about this two-sided, the spruce, the two-sided needles before I had ever encountered it. And um, I remember going up to one in the nursery and recognizing that it was a spruce as I saw the pegs. And then I put the foliage in my fingers and I thought, oh, could this be, could this be the... Uh, the two-sided spruce, the spruce with the two-sided needles that I had read about, and yes, it was. And so that was an exciting day. <laughs> um, also, the buds in uh, spruce are often rusty colored like this, and, and sometimes they have this, this frilliness. The bud scales will kind of curl, curl back a bit. But that also tells you that, um, I mean, some pines, there are maybe a couple of pines that do this, but you're not going to mistake a spruce for a pine because spruce don't have the fascicles. One other thing that you want to look for to get to, to species ID is whether the cone of your spruce is hard and stiff or papery and thin. Um, all spruce either have one or the other and it'll, it'll very quickly in combination with whether the needles are square, um, get you to species ID. Um, this is the Norway spruce, which has these very long uh, cones, all cones in the spruce genus uh, or the, the branch end like this, um, but it's very stiff. The cones are very, very stiff and the scales are very stiff. And typically the scale edges of um, these stiff cones are, are smooth like this. Um, or they're gonna be papery, like here um, with the Colorado blue spruce. Uh, you see that um, 
the scale, these scales are much thinner. When you pick this up, it's kind of going to crinkle a little bit uh, when it's dry. Um, and the edges of the scales of uh, the spruce uh, with the, the thin scales is, is ragged like this. And this is a very beautiful um, young Colorado blue spruce cone, which I was fortunate to get because normally spruce don't, uh, the blue spruce don't set cones lower down, but I did happen to, upon a branch that was lower and had all these cones on it. And so that was pretty lucky. Yeah. And if you if you look at them side by side, you can see that the differences are quite visible. Um, and even though you may not get like a fresh cone for a blue spruce, you usually can, it's very easy to find them on the ground if, it's, if it is setting cones. One more thing that can tell you that you're in the spruce genus is the bark. Um, bark of all spruces is thin and flaky like this. Um, and here, and you can actually collect bark, which is kind of fun. And um, there are some differences in color, the, the color of bark uh, from species to species. So that can be helpful. Uh, you can take bark and bring it home with you and then look up, you know, what color, what color it is uh, for the different species. I have these like jigsaw colored pieces. And because the bark is always sloughing off like this, uh, it maintains a thin bark. And so spruce are not fire to tolerant. They, they do uh, burn up in fires. Um, but, you know, I was noticing, uh, you know, last year when I was walking in um, a Sitka spruce forest here on the Oregon coast, which is dominated by Sitka spruce, that the entire forest floor is just covered in these um, these flakes of bark, it's like the tree is self-mulching. And of course, all trees are self-mulching in the sense that they're always you know, dropping organic matter onto the soil. But in this case, it was actually bark mulch. <laughs> Just sort of an interesting observation. So the spruce genus as a whole is very cold hardy. Um, and uh, after the ice ages of the Pleistocene, uh, as the glaciers receded, uh, Spruce spread across um, the boreal forests in uh, northern Canada and in Eurasia to dominate the forests there. In North America, and some of these uh, forests in, uh, do dip down, these boreal forests do dip down into the northern parts of the U.S., um, are dominated by white spruce and black spruce. And then across Europe and Asia, the Norway spruce, uh, which gives way to the Siberian spruce uh, over here in uh, Asia. Um, and so one thing when you are in a boreal forest, you see conifers everywhere. But, so you see many conifers in numbers, but you don't see a lot of diversity because those boreal forests are difficult uh, uh, to adapt to. And as you get further north, you find fewer and fewer species that are able to adapt to that harsh environment. Um, and here's a beautiful weeping white spruce. That's from Isley Nursery. Um, which is one of the uh, fantastic cultivar, which has a small footprint. And so you can fit it in many, many spaces, but gets um, quite tall over time. Um, and I was back there again recently, and this, uh, this giant sequoia here pendulum is, has, is gone. It had bro broken a storm a couple of years ago. Um, so those uh, spruce that aren't uh, boreal are maritime, like the um, Sitka spruce, or you find them in the mountains like our Engelman spruce out here on the Northwest. Okay, we're gonna move on to the true cedar genus, uh, which really is really home to some spe spectacular trees. Um, it has four species um, or so, depending on uh, what book you read. And uh, as a group, the cedars are actually quite easy to identify to genus uh, because of this very unique Way that the that the foliage grows on top of these fir shoots in whorls, um, and the older the whorl, um, the taller the spur shoot is. Uh, you see, there's little scars on this spur shoot. Each little scar represents one year of growth. Um, so if you've had the patience, <laughs> you could count these and you could determine how old this little shoot is. Um, now I must admit, if you have a miniature or a very dwarf cultivar of a, of a cedar, this spur shoot could be very tiny and it could be very difficult to identify that it has one, but you will see still that the, 
the needles are in whorls, um, which will tell you that you are in the true cedar genus. A truly magnificent foliage. Um, true cedars also set these magnificent barrel shaped cones that also grow on spur shoots. You can't see the spur shoot here, it's obscured, but here in the back, here's a, a younger cone and you can see it has quite a distinct spur shoot. And, um, spur shoot, sorry. Uh, and I do think that these cones, this is the Lebanon cedar, which is the nicest cones in the genus, it's really a work of art to me. It's just, there's nothing quite more magnificent than this um, found in nature and in conifers. Unfortunately, the cones break apart at maturity, um, so you can't save them. <laughs> and uh, there's really no way to stop it from breaking apart. Uh, I've tried and uh, nothing works. Hairspray, dipping it in polyurethane, uh, they will break apart. Uh, so it's a fleeting pleasure. So interesting uh, about the true cedar genus is that it takes two full years from pollination uh, to seed release, um, the longest in the family. And it is the only genus in the pine family to release pollen in the fall. So this whole cycle, reproductive cycle starts in the fall. Um, and another feature of the true cedar genus is they set these enormous pollen cones. Um, you can see there's my hand, this is probably three inches long. Uh, or longer, um, and pollen is released in the fall. And I, I've often wondered, like, wouldn't it be wonderful if these cones were decorative, like colored, like purple, like they are, or red, like they are in some of the other genera, but unfortunately they're pretty drab. Um, and at this point, the female cone is too small to see, but it's there, but just too small to see with the naked eye. And so it goes through its first winter rest period at this point. And then in the spring, the cone uh, fertilization happens. The pollen tube reaches the egg and fertilizes it. The cone becomes visible. And then in that summer, it, it grows a little bit over the summer, not too much. It stays quite small, but nice to look at uh, and enters its second winter rest period. And then in the summer of year two, here is a, a, a day or dark cedar cone. You see it has a little bit of a difference than the the Lebanon cedar was flat on the top and this one is rounded. That's one way to differentiate the two. Um, it grows to its full sort of egg, egg shaped size that second summer and then disintegrates that fall or that winter. So it takes actually three growing seasons. You have the first growing season when it pollinated and the second growing season when it got fertilized and then the third growing season when it fully matured, but um, it's clearly worth the wait. <laughs> the cones are magnificent. Um, three of the four uh, cedar species are native to the Mediterranean basin. Uh, the Lebanon cedar is native to Turkey, Syria, and Lebanon. The Cypriot cedar, which many consider to be um, a subspecies of the Lebanon cedar, is native to Cyprus. Uh, and then the Atlas cedar is native to Morocco and Algeria. However, at one time, this was a continue, if you follow my thing here, a continuous range of cedars all along this Mediterranean coast. Here. These are now what represent disjunct and fragmented populations of a, a, of a distribution which was quite vast at one time. And the fourth, uh, Cedar uh, is native to the Himalayan plateau. That's the Deodar cedar. So some um, botanists would tell you that these three cedar species are really just one species that have slight differentiations now, but they're typically sold in the horticultural trade as four separate species. Um, this Atlantic cedar has quite a small um, distribution in the wild now, and is as is, is, is it's getting hotter and drier, its range is moving up up higher into the mountains to find more suitable habitat. And they're quite cold hardy, so they, they do well in a lot of places. And I just wanted to put up one picture of a whole tree. I know we look at the, the, the parts of a tree so carefully um, out of context to, uh, to, to, go, to go to species idea. I just want to make sure you just see what a beautiful tree they are. And um, the branches are very layered. Um, 
and magnificent to look at. But large trees though, but there are many, many wonderful small cultivars that would fit into your backyard. We're going to move on to the true fur genus, which has about 40, 46 species. And here on the left is a picture of the interior of a grand fur cone, which is quite colorful. Uh, happened upon a whole bunch of these that some squirrels had chewed down out of a tree uh, in central Oregon. And I was just so surprised to see how beautiful pink and orange and just how spectacularly colorful the inside of that cone was. So the one thing that tells you that you're in the true fur genus is that the needles have circular leaf bases and leave circular leaf scars on the twig. And uh, this feature can be hard to see sometimes. Um, it seems small. And these are two species that have quite large needles. This is a white fur on the right here and a, quite a large um, attachment to the twig. Uh, and so, but in some of the other species with the foliage is more delicate, you, you're gonna have to look carefully. I mean, it, it takes a while to get your eyes adjusted to this detail, but um, it is very separate, different from a spruce, which is what you're most likely to uh, confuse a true fur for. Um, true fur has that distinct peg. Um, and also true fur needles are, are two-sided. They don't have multiple sides like spruce. And they also have these very smooth twigs, which also differentiates it from spruce. So just like, let's just put that spruce uh, twig up there for comparison. Uh, since these are the, the two things you're gonna mostly confuse each other with, you see how it has the peg and the grooves there. And this is just has that smooth, very smooth um, twig. So if you're thinking, well, maybe it's a spruce, you know, um, convince yourself by feeling that twig. And, and if it's bumpy, then you've probably got a spruce. And if it's not bumpy, you've got something else. And, and sometimes that is a really good way to get to genus ID is by the process of elimination. So you get the seven, you know, or so genera here. Uh, and just to sort of say what it isn't first, it's not a true cedar, it's not a pine, it's not a this, it's not a that, and what you're left with. And that can of, often be very, very helpful in determining what genus you're in. Um, true, fair, true fur foliage is oriented to the twig uh, in many different ways. And this can get you to species ID or help you get much more close to species ID. Um, there's only one true fur that has foliage that encircles the twig like spruce do. And that is um, the Spanish fur, the Abies pinsapo. It also has very stiff foliage, but the foliage is not sharp or pointy. And of course, and it doesn't have pegs. So that's how you would know uh, it's not a spruce. But this this, you know, me walking up to it with the look of the foliage and, you know, how stiff the foliage is, uh, you might um, mistake it for a spruce, but it, it is isn't pointy and it is multiple, does not have multiple sides. So some, some once in a rare while, like this, you'll have a fur where the foliage encircles the twig. Uh, sometimes it'll be comb forward, such as in the silver fur, this silver, silver fur, which is a native of Pacific Northwest fur. Abies amabilis, um, and it conceals the twig. Sometimes uh, the, the twig will be exposed like this and the foliage will be uh, flattened to the side, um, almost like hair parted down the middle. This is the grand fur. Um, and this is typical of foliage that grows in the shade. Um, it's, uh, it grows out flat to, to harvest as much light as possible. And then, in the case of a white fir, you find this upswept foliage, which is typical of firs that grow in full sun. Um, those, those angles are meant to soften the rays of the sun uh, on the foliage. So you really want to look at how the foliage is attaching to the twig in true fir. It will be very, very helpful to get you to species ID. True firs also set magnificent upright cones that also disintegrate. Uh, Interestingly enough, uh, like the two fur cones. Um, unfortunately, you probably won't have a cone um, to get to species ID because in most furs, there are exceptions. The cones set almost only after many years when the tree is quite tall and they are typically concentrated at the top of the branch, atop of the tree. 
So you'll have to crane your neck to see them or look through, um, you know, uh, your the telephoto lens on your on your camera. Um, exceptions to, to furs that do set cones lower down and uh, when they're young are the Spanish fir. So it's a very, uh, really recommend it for as a horticultural tree. Um, this is, I took this picture at the nursery. This These cones are setting in the pot in the nursery. This is a, a dwarf. Uh, I don't, I can't remember what the cultivar is. Also Korean furs also set cones young um, and lower down and are another great uh, ornamental true fur for that reason. Um, this is the noble fir cone, which is the most magnificent cone in the in the true fir genus. This is like nine inches tall, and it has exerted bracts. Uh, so the cone scale is made up of a bract. Uh, uh, the cone is made up of a scale and a bract. And usually, for most species, the bract is hidden. It's small and it's hidden in between the scales. But in the case of the noble fir, it's quite large and it sticks out, and making the cone appear yellow. Um, this cone, I, I, this is a dog park back here. This is where I take my dog and I saw these cones growing across the field and I thought, could that be what I think it is? Could those be noble fir cones? And I went running over and uh, this was maybe a six or seven foot tree. This tree was dying, which is why it said cones. Sometimes uh, trees will will do that. They will divert all resources to cone production when they, when they know they're close to death. And this tree died that very fall, but I was able to harvest this cone. So I was very, very happy. Um, and here's a picture of the spikes that are left behind on the tree, um, which also is a clue. If you see these, don't see any fresh cones, but you see these spikes uh, that and, and without the dispersion, you should know you're in the true fur genus. But I just wanted to put up, put up some pictures of uh, maybe brag about our native true furs here out in the West. Uh, white fir, noble fir, and subalpine fir to give you a sense of what their form looks like. Um, these are all magnificent trees. This white fir is atypical. It has this double crown, uh, very beautiful. Cemetery is a great place to get pictures of trees <laughs> because they're not usually crowded. They usually are nice and separate. Um, noble fir and subalpine fir also make lovely landscape trees because they have a small footprint, but they, they often just don't make it off the mountain. So they have a high attrition rate, but when they do uh, survive off the mountain, you know, in the lower landscape, uh, ornamental landscape, uh, they are magnificent. Oops, all right. Um, two fur are mostly species of the mountains. Um, in, in, in Europe, which is, is a very, very low number of conifer species because many did not survive the ice ages, uh, the firs have very restricted ranges, um, places that they retreated to during the ice ages, you know, and in Europe, uh, all species, not just conifer species, you know, um, were denied a, a northern retreat by the con continental ice sheets coming from the north, and then the alpine glaciers from the south uh, denied them a southern retreat, you know, so there was no place that they could sort of hide out. And so there just are not that many conifer species in Europe comp compared to the United States. Um, they were just squeezed both sides by the glaciers. And uh, so the ones that could survive uh, in the mountains uh, are the ones that made it. This is a, a beautiful Spanish fir cultivar. I, I don't know what cultivar this is um, because it was unlabeled, but they're, they're really beautiful trees, beautiful foliage. Okay, we're going to uh, move on to the hemlock genus, uh, about nine species. Um, here's a picture of a, a young mountain hemlock cone, uh, which is the only species in the genus that sets colorful cones. Um, and mountain hemlock is also different for many other reasons too. It's the only hemlock that is uh, drought tolerant and loves the sun. All As, as a rule, um, they are shade loving trees. So what tells you that you're in, uh, all hemlocks have this same trait, which is uh, the needles have a short stem that is parallel to the twig, as I have uh, demonstrated here with this box, highlighted here with this box. You see at the end of the of leaf, it takes a, the stem takes a 90 degree turn and then terminates into a peg. So it has the peg, um, like spruce do, but you're really probably not gonna confuse a hemlock with a spruce because the needles 
are two-sided. They're never, they don't have multiple sides. They're never sharp. They might be a little pointed, um, but they're never going to be sharp. Um, and they don't encircle the twig. So there's really nothing else that's going to, there's no really other clue here that's going to say spruce. Um, and this is the really lovely foliage of the Northern Japanese hemlock, which is short. Um, doesn't look so short because this is quite blown up, but it's a short kind of fat needle with very dark green foliage. Um, so this that is the one um, feature that tells you you are in the hemlock genus. Um, and to get to species, um, it's a little more difficult uh, because the cones pretty much are you know not very distinct. They age from green to brown, like I said, except for the mountain hemlock, um, and are small and not and not very. Um, they don't have any real features that are going to identify um, the species. Um, and I'm not going to get into the, the the foliage differences, but it's how the you know, some of the foliage sort of attaches to the branch, at different angles in some species and uh, things like that. Um, but, which we don't really have time to get into today, but just remember that um, you want to look for that stem that's parallel to the twig. Um, and except again for the mountain hemlock, they are sh a shade tolerant genus, the, the only shade tolerant genus as a whole in the pine family. And they are the rare conifer that, that dominates an understory um, because it, most conifers are aren't really shade loving. Some are, there are a couple of fur that love the shade, but you know, as a genus, as a whole, they they really do love the shade um, and they are not drought tolerant. So in the West here, where we have very dry summers, the Western hemlock um, has adapted to those dry summers by germinating on uh, nurse logs, oftentimes Douglas fir. And um, a nurse log stays very wet, it's very spongy. Uh, a dead a tree trunk as it decomposes becomes very spongy and um, holds water very, very well. And so those young trees have their roots directly in that spongy um, down tree, uh, which lets it allows it to survive our dry summers. Um, and here is a picture of the Western hemlock, which is very difficult to get a, a nice picture of because they are understory trees and there's always other trees around them and uh, always not a lot of sun. And then the mountain hemlock here, a magnificent tree in the wild, is a picture of it in the wild. Um, it makes a great landscape tree, uh, small footprint. Uh, uh, and they have varied form. Some of the, sometimes you see the specimens with very droopy branches. Um, but the hemlock species in the Eastern United States, uh, the Canadian hemlock and the Carolina hemlock are in trouble. Um, they are susceptible to the hemlock woolly adelgid, um, which is really decimating for us, uh, unfortunately. Um, unfortunately for us in the West, the Western hemlock and the mountain hemlock uh, are not uh, susceptible to that bug because the bug has been here uh, in the West for 20,000 years and uh, our populations have evolved to be resistant to it. So we are lucky in that way. Oops. We are going to get to larch. Um, so I want to talk about this. Larch are deciduous conifers. Um, aren't that many deciduous conifers, uh, but the whole genus of larch is deciduous. Um, and the foliage grows on whorls, on spur shoots like this. And I discovered in Bend, Oregon, at a park, this western larch that has compound whorls. So just advance for a second. This is what a typical branch looks like, a spur shoot looks like, it has one spur shoot on one set of world foliage. But here you see a spur shoot it then has many, many, many other spur shoots growing out of it. So this could make a great new cultivar. <laughs> anyway, maybe 30% or 40% of this tree has um, this unique compound world on it. And I visited a couple of years in a row and uh, it's quite, quite astonishing. As a larch is a smaller genus of 10 species or so. And as I said, uh, the foliage is deciduous and uh, it's when um, larch are really at their most beautiful in the fall when the color does change. Um, and they get this very beautiful amber tones to them. 
Here's a European large, large on the left and on the right, um, the Volterdingen Japanese large, which gets these beautiful multi-toned colors of the green foliage kind of fades to a turquoise. Um, unfortunately, this, this was mine in my backyard and it died and it died because I did not give it enough sun. Larch are really intolerant of shade. Um, they need as much sun as you can give them and they really won't survive without a lot of sun. So please do, if you get one, you know, put it in the full sun, Don't no shade. <laughs> They're intolerant of shade. Um, again, they're deciduous, uh, and here you have a picture of the sweet little um, whorls of foliage emerging in the fall, I mean, sorry, in the spring, and here you have a picture of um, the branch in winter with all the cones on it, which looks convincingly dead. Um, as master gardeners, sometimes you get uh, calls from people thinking that their tree is dead because this really does look like a dead tree, and uh, one reason um, is because uh, large hold on to their cones indefinitely. They really don't drop the cones. The cones kind of drop when the branch drops off the tree. So it's in the winter, it, you have this like full set of cones throughout the tree without foliage, um, doing a convincing impression of a dead tree. Um, and the cones are kind of delightful. They um, mature over one growing season and they also grow on spur shoots and um, they're quite colorful when they're young in the spring. And uh, the spur shoot will hook to whatever degree is ne necessary to hold that cone upright. Um, and, and you also, when you wanna get to species ID, you wanna know whether that cone has an exerted rack or not, racked or not. Um, I believe this is the Western larch, which you know, does not. Uh, um, Uh, as a as a genus, they're highly cold tolerant. Um, they're they are generally, um, uh, you know, they're boreal species and they're species of, of subalpine sub species, except for a couple. Um, uh, as the uh, ice sheets and the glaciers receded in the ice ages, uh, the larch are the first species to move in. They move in uh, right after the glaciers recede, uh, the continental ice sheets receded, you know, so you have the boreal larches, you have the um, uh, the, the tamarack, the eastern larch, the uh, Larix laricina, and then you have um, uh, Larix, uh, the subalpine larch here, the Larix lyellii, which is moves in after the alpine glaciers recede. Um, and in many cases, they're occupying niches that other trees simply can't tolerate. You know, it's just too harsh. Um, and, and I think they are, it's probably the most cold hardy genus. I mean, it's spruce, you know, and together with spruce, but larcher are just one notch more cold hardy. Many of the larches are one notch more cold hardy than the spruces. Um, and this subalpine larch here as a species is, um, having a harder and harder time finding suitable habitat because you know we're, alpine glaciers are becoming in, you know scarcer and scarcer um uh and so its range is diminishing as those alpine glaciers diminish uh, as well okay we're going to finish up with the douglas fir these are young douglas fir cones um which are really beautiful and decorative when they first emerge in the spring and uh would look lovely in any indoor uh, vase arrangement, flower arrangement. Um, cones are very distinct in Douglas fir set cones very readily. Um, they're beautiful when they're young, extremely colorful um, with these contrasting greens and pinks and purples. And they have this exerted bract, which is always described as a mouse tail. Um, and you will always find, you'll, you won't be at a loss for uh, for cones when you're trying to identify a Douglas fir. It is four species in the genus, two here in the US and two in Asia. And then if you have a little cultivar, um, you can always identify uh, Douglas fir by its buds. They're hard and shiny and pointy and they're unmistakable. They don't look like anything else. Um, and this is just a, what a typical tree looks like. And there you can see 
the buds on the twig. And it looks like true fir foliage, looks like a little, a little bit like true fir, a little bit like spruce, but the bud and the cones will always tell you that you are have a Douglas fir. Okay, questions? <laughs> we got through everything. I hope I wasn't talking too fast. <laughs> You were not speaking fast at all, Elizabeth, thank you. Uh, <laughs> the, the only thing better than the pictures was the information. Oh. The presentation. Oh, thank you. We, thank you. We have a couple of members here, uh, Dave and Sherry Speth and Tess Park. Uh, they're old pros at this, and they're going to scan the chat room uh, to get questions for you. I know a couple have been entered already. For the rest of you, please put your uh, questions in chat and we'll enable um, the videos if you want to be recognized to ask an oral question. So Scotty Hart uh, asked that larches prefer sun, but how much heat can they tolerate? Oh, you went away again. Okay. He wonders uh, if... Uh, Larches prefer sun, but how much heat can they tolerate? Oh, they can tolerate a lot of heat because, you know, the solar uh, in the mountains, the solar radiation is is pretty strong. Um, they, they can tolerate a lot of heat as well. I mean, uh, I don't think you're going to be uh, planting them in a really uh, like hot and humid, like maybe in the southeast, um, unless you have a nice dry spot. Um, and they are tolerant of very poor soil because that glacial soil has nothing in it, no nutrients in it. Um, so they do well in poor soil, um, but hot, hot, hot and sun, they're gonna be very, very happy. Um, because the Western larch, for instance, uh, there are a couple of the larches that uh, are more mountainous, you know, like the Western larch and the Japanese larch, which are the two most popular in cultivation. Um, uh, I just think they're more adaptable to the environmental landscape. Uh, you know, the Western Larch gets, you know, is from the east side here, which is very, very hot, very sunny. You know. East side of the mountains. Yeah. So another person asked, how much uh, water do they need? How much water do they need? Well, um, Western larch grow in Oregon and the Pacific Northwest on the dry side of the mountains. So they are, they are tolerant of summer drought um, in those poor uh, mountain soils. Um, so they are, they are also drought tolerant. Um, the ones, uh, certainly uh, the Western larch is drought tolerant. Um, I would think, you know, when you get into the more the boreal, boreal larches, they're going to have different water needs because um, there's just more water up there, you know, sometimes even swampy conditions. And Marilyn asked, uh, is Cedrus Theodora a true cedar? I'm sorry, that didn't come through. Okay, uh, one of the questions was, is Cedrus Theodora a true cedar? It, did you say, is Cedrus Theodora a true cedar? Was that the question? Yes. Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, it is a true cedar. So uh, true cedars versus false cedars. Um, there are very few cedar, um, conifer species in Europe. So when the Europeans came to the New World, um, they had never seen anything like our Western red cedar and Alaskan cedar with that kind of foliage, because there actually are no species in Europe aside from the Italian cypress, which is really not really more of a Mediterranean species. Um, in most of Europe, most of the colonizing uh, nations. Uh, and so they just gave them these common names, like a true cedar looks nothing like um, a Western red cedar, but apparently the aroma reminded Europeans um, of the true cedar, or reminded, uh, reminded them of, of, a, of a cedar. So they called Alaskan cedar and you know Western red cedar cedars. Um, so yes, yeah, so the, the only true cedars are the Deodar cedar, the cypress cedar, the Lebanon cedar, and the atlas cedar, those four. Elizabeth? Yes. Uh, uh, Wisconsin Elizabeth. also has a native large growing in our yeah. swamps. Uh, what oh. do you know yeah. about that one? 
Um, that would be the um, the tamarack, I believe. The larix. Yes. Um, yeah, it's it's the boreal larch. Some of the boreal species do um, dip down into like the upper Midwest and the northern. Um, Again, it's going to want full sun, but if it's one of the boreal larches, it, it's going to appreciate, you know, a wet, you know, wet feet, wetter, wetter soil, as opposed to the mountainous ones, which are, you know, more tolerant of that, um, that dry, uh, that, that dry, hot soil. Okay. I know and... it, has a, it has a huge range that, that um, the tamarack has a huge range, very successful, um, very successful species. And Paul uh, asked, could you talk a bit more about which species handle fire better with regard to both fire resistant bark and cones that only open as a result of fire? How and where did this characteristic evolve? Um, well, most of the uh, fire resistant um, species in the pine family are gonna be in the pine, pine genus. The pine genus as a whole um, is tolerant of those harsh uh, conditions. Um, the ponderosa pine has fire resistant bark. Uh, the cones do not open as a result of fire. They open yearly and, and shed their uh, seeds yearly. Um, the knob cone pine is one of those pines that uh, the cones stay shut. The, they're called serotonous cones uh, and only open when they're like, you know, subjected to very, very hot temperatures. Um, uh, as I said, spruce as a genus are not fire tolerant at all. Not, neither are larch. Um, true fir also are not tolerant to fire. Uh, Douglas fir, of course, is fire tolerant. The bark is very thick and spun not spongy, but it's very thick bark as it gets older. But the cones um, do not open open yearly. They're not. Um, they don't stay shut. Um, Try to think the lodgepole pine. Uh, it does not have, um, it's interesting. So it, the tree itself is not uh, fire adapted. The bark is thin and it burns down in a fire, but the cones are. So some of the cones open yearly and some of the cones stay shut and open only with fire. And then they seed down like mad. That is their strategy to, to their strategy to, serve, to survive fire is to have the tree burn and then to move in after, after the fire and to seed down. Like there are certain areas um, that I've seen where lodgepole pines have seeded down after a disturbance. And it's like a thicket, it's like a thicket of pines. It's pretty uh, uh, remarkable. And large too, um, the tree is not, um, it burns right down in a fire and the cones do not open as a result of fire, but as a species, it moves in quickly after a disturbance and seeds down. Um, like the Western larch, um, will be the first, it's like a pioneer species. It moves in after a disturbance and seeds down very readily. Um, and a lot of times you see the large pole pine and the larch, you know, sort of competing each other uh, in that post-disturbance uh, site. Um, so it's just interesting. Some, you know, you wouldn't think that a tree that burns right down in a fire has fire adaptations, but you know, they do. It's just a different, a different strategy. Um, those are the ones I can think of off the top of my head. Um. Okay, Sarah also asks, uh, my black spruce took a big hit last summer. Only the lower branches still have needles. Any idea why this happened? Uh, well, I have to know more about um, what went on, you know, the previous year. Um, I have to look at the tree to see if there's any sign of disease or pests. Um, insect presence, uh, uh, it just, um, I would have to, you know, it, it would need pictures. <laughs> she wants to send me pictures of, of the tree and the branches and foliage I, and, and any history of what happened uh, there in the past year or so in terms of drought or wind or uh, anything like that or what's happening to, to the other trees around it. It's very difficult to make a diagnosis like that without you know, more information about the plant. Okay, and Marilyn asks, can you recommend a source of information for dwarf cultivars, particularly shade tolerant ones? 
Oh, um, well, if you want shade tolerant cultivars, um, look to the hemlock genus. <laughs> um, Japanese hemlock, the Japanese northern hemlock uh, has a number of cultivars that are smaller and lovely, like the Minikin, the Lewitt, um, and there's many Canadian hemlock cultivars that are also shade tolerant. Um, uh, As a rule, conifers aren't terribly uh, shade tolerant, but the hemlocks are an exception. Um, sometimes there are some spruce that can do well in, in more shady uh, conditions. I mean, sources for cultivars, I mean, uh, I would go to the, if you wanna just have a lot of eye candy, go to the Isley website, you know, when they have a, a great, um, they catalog all their trees, uh, all, all the things that they offer for sale, they're a wholesaler, but, um, uh, look at, we we'll look specifically at hemlocks and some of the spruce. Uh, and, you know, there are also some two firs that are somewhat, uh, you know, the silver fir is um, shade tolerant to the Andes amabilis. Uh, so I would go to their website and uh, look for those um, species and uh, see, you know, what you like and what you don't like. <laughs> Elizabeth, I have a, a comment. Um, very few people speak about the microbiota desiccata, the uh -huh. Russian cypress, and that one is shade tolerant and very cold hardy. Can you speak yeah. about that one, please? Yes, it is. It's, it is the rare, it's not in the pine family, it is in the cypress family. Um, it, it has uh, scale-like foliage, flattened scale-like foliage, and it is the rare conifer that it, conifer that is a shrub naturally. Most conifers in nature are trees. Um, conifers don't compete well in the understory, like at the shrub level. You don't see a lot of natural species that are shrubs. The mugo pine is an exception, uh, except the mugo pine um, in its natural environment grows in the mountains and it doesn't, it's in the full sun. Uh, it's more like a, a mountain plant. Um, but the that, that Siberian cypress is a lovely, um, low growing shrub uh, that can kind of function as a ground cover and spreads and is um, a, really, a really beautiful addition to a garden. Um, can be hard to find, but you know, but not terribly hard to find. Probably every nursery won't have it. Maybe one that has a good, a, a good conifer selection. Um, but yeah, it's a wonderful, and it is shade tolerant for that person looking for a shade tolerant conifer. That's a very good suggestion. Byron, I think I, I found all the questions. I, and Sherry, you did a great job. Thank you. And there were some good questions there. Yeah, yeah. It's exciting. It's a time of year. You know, it's we're having a, a spring day here today in Portland. So <laughs> I know it's too early to plant, but one can't help but th think about it. <laughs> well, Elizabeth, once again, thank you very much. And for everyone that is still on, uh, there'll be an email within the next week. Uh, I'm sure some of you are going to want to review the recording once it's available uh, to see this again, that so much information you couldn't absorb at all. That was just Yes, I know. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> and some of it was new. Even, even us old timers heard new things, and we thank you so much. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. It was my pleasure, really. Thank you so much, Byron. And thanks, Perfect. Jeff. Thank Jeff for me. I will indeed.